Hello, everyone, and welcome to Eureka Connect. Uh, for those of you who are new, um, thank you for joining us. We have an incredible um, panel of entrepreneurs who will be pitching their businesses today, and also really incredible investors who are here to join us as well. Um, to give you all an introduction to Eureka, just in case you're new, um, Eureka is a platform where we provide equitable access to economic opportunity for underserved entrepreneurs. And we do this by connecting entrepreneurs to people to help strengthen their team through our community of coaches, mentors, and peers. We do this through our programs where we help entrepreneurs develop uh, viable growth programs or plans to help grow their business, and also the connections. Um, facilitating access to capital and vetted specialists, assuring that entrepreneurs um, spend money on the right things, but also help bridge the access gap to capital where we know that a lot of our underserved entrepreneurs typically have a tough time reaching investors and, um, and other sources of capital. So thank you for joining. Today, uh, we're doing Eureka Connect and it is a program where it's going to be a pitch competition, but we're taking it a step further where we're having our entrepreneurs pitch not only for a chance to get investment by connecting with investors, but also to get much needed feedback um, so that they can position themselves for greater investment opportunities moving forward. And we have a great uh, community of investors with us today. In the past, we've done Eureka Connect. The last one we did was focus on our LGBTQ community, where they focused on uh, pitching for a chance to raise uh, $5,000. Um, and we're doing a different version this time where we're connecting entrepreneurs to investors. For this Eureka Connect, we're focused on businesses that are run by women or supporting women uh, and companies that are seeking between $25,000 and $1 million for the total raise. And we're agnostic about how they raise it, whether it's a convertible note, equity, or a non-traditional uh, type of funding. So joining us today, um, we're actually going to get into how this will work. Each entrepreneur will have seven minutes to pitch their business. And then uh, they will have five minutes to answer questions from their investors. After that, after we go through all of that, there will be a decision that is made of whether uh, a yes to continue the conversation for a potential investment opportunity or a pass. But with all of this, you will be getting feedback on what they liked, what they're looking for so that you can uh, better prepare next time going forward. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce you to some of our investors, uh, starting with Caroline Pike. Would you like to introduce yourself? I would be happy to. Nice to meet everybody. Oh, I do hate that large picture. <laughs> As far as you look nothing like your picture, we all know that. Um, <laughs> Carolyn Ficka, I'm a member of Golden Seeds. And for those of you who don't know, Golden Seeds' focus is on investing in high growth potential uh, companies that have a diverse management team. There has to be at least one woman on this in the C-suite, and that woman has to be a significant owner of equity. Generally, that woman is a founder, but doesn't have to be. By way of my own personal background, um, I actually worked on Wall Street for a lot of years, 18, 19 years, in investment banking, and with a focus on middle market companies, in particular in the retail and consumer sector, and transitioning as I did about eight years ago, joined Golden Seeds, and more recently, as an angel investor, and more recently have been asked to run the consumer sector group. So it's anything that's B2C or B2B2C. It can be a product, it can be an application. Um, so that becomes my focus even within Golden Seeds. And nice to be here, it really is. Thank you, Carolyn. And next we have Kelly. Hey everyone, it's great to be here today. I actually recently just left the big tech world, having spent the last few years uh, building and launching new products and businesses at Facebook and LinkedIn. 
uh, getting back to my roots uh, and passion in, go in the early stage and startup world. I'm an individual angel investor and part of an amazing group of operators, founders, and entrepreneurs at TBD Angels. Uh, we really focus on uh, a community that can, you know, get our hands, uh, get our roll up our sleeves, uh, help help our founders, uh, and you know, a lot of us are founders, founders ourselves. Um, I'm really passionate about mentoring and coaching, so I like to work with teams and companies. Uh, I recently just joined the Board of Advisors at Pace University to work on their transformative leadership program. Uh, but most importantly, I can't wait to hear from these three amazing female founders, learn what you've been up to, and see if there's anything I can do to help. Thank you. And now, Aurelia. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to hear you pitch, so I'll be short. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Citrine Angels. And so Citrine Angels is a group of women investors investing in women founders uh, in my local area, which is the greater DMV area. And my background, I own a marketing agency currently. And prior to that, I worked uh, as an intellectual property and corporate attorney for almost 20 years, first at a large law firm and then at a Fortune 500. And so I was on the acquiring end of, of a startup. So we would do a lot of acquisitions of other companies. So excited to hear you all pitch and um, see if you're ready to pitch to Citrine and what that might look like. But either way, happy to give feedback and always, always excited to talk to you and, and meet more female founders. Thank you, Aurelia. And here are today's finalists for those who are joining in. We have three investment ready companies that are ready to pitch. We have Lilita, we have New Flowers and Avenida Productions. Going first, we will have uh, Rena Andrews uh, from Lilita and I'll hand over control to you, okay? So am I. There you go, you can click through and there you go. Okay, perfect. Um, hi, my name is Rena Andrews. I'm CEO and designer of Lalita and I wanna thank you all for taking the time to be here today. And I invite you to step into the world of Lalita where beyond basic meets basic needs. Lalita was inspired by my grandmother's vintage garter clip and is an homage to a time when the slightest gust of wind could evoke the imagination. Lalita is the Hindu goddess of bliss and her name means she who plays. We're a premium luxury and fashion lifestyle brand that creates bold and elegant collections with a seductive twist on classic styles. The first world problem, finding stylish, size inclusive and comfortable high quality basics. The global problem, Basic needs, finding basics. Underwear is actually the most underdonated and most needed item of clothing. So what's our solution? Capitalize on the COVID era of comfortable fashion and social responsibility by empowering women one knicker at a time. But we use luxuriously soft and sustainable bamboo fabric and create size inclusive styles with a seductive twist. Beyond basics for Lolita woman and basic dignity for every woman. Think of this as a Bombas for women's basics. What's our evolution? Um, Pre-COVID, one of the things we did was reinvent the tank top. Um, our innovation actually got us selected as one of 10 brands to watch in 2020 by Curve, which is the largest North American trade show in lingerie. During COVID, like everyone else, we introduced fashion masks and incorporated one-to-one -one mask donations. And it's not really post-COVID, but post the start of COVID, um, we're back to selling ba uh, basics and looking at incorporating the one-to-one -one model into basics donations. So the team behind it, me, um, Brown graduate, lifetime entrepreneur and educated uh, educator, um, essentially the one woman show behind this. Um, I have Sohani working with me on finance. She's Harvard and Fashion Institute designer merchandising grad. And Maria is there with development. I've been working with her since our successful Kickstarter in 2015. And she's the reason why our products have incredible fit and I've had two returns in five years. So what's the opportunity? Well, we all know sweatpants are winning right now, but the truth is that the loungewear market was growing pre-COVID as well. And the global intimate market is look, looking to be 325 billion by 2025. Um, and with a um, compound annual growth rate of almost 9% during this period. 
And within that, there's a need for designer and premium sleepwear and loungewear. And one of the things driving, driving this is sustainable manufacturing, um, especially as fashion is facing a reckoning um, for being such a major polluter. Uh, within this, there's still an underserved plus size market and a lot of the sustainable luxury brands actually stop at a size 12 and maybe a 14 in um, loungewear and basics. So why Lalita? Well, Bombas took two years to develop the perfect sock, but we've already perfected uh, multiple panties and a lot more. So I'm bringing to you research and development, proof of concept through customer validation, tastemaker validation, industry validation, and store validation, um, as well as really creating products with a superior quality and fit that make women feel amazing when they wear them. Um, while the competitive landscape might look a bit crowded, but the truth is that if you put brands in a line, all of them, you couldn't pick one out um, because they all look the same. And our competitive edge really is distinctive basics with a brand recognition. And we still check the box of having luxuriously soft fabric and insanely comfortable design while offering size inclusivity and a one-to-one -one donation model. Our ability to combine edginess with comfort and wearability is why Lalita goes beyond basic. Our target customer is stylish women who appreciate classic styles and quality with an edge, such as the very lovely Sharon Stone who um, rocked our bralette for her own bralette for her 60th birthday in the New York Times. Um, essentially, occasional to frequency luxury brand shoppers higher income bracket, um, age 25 to 65, but our market tends to skew or my customers tend to skew more in the 35 to 55 bracket um, because they've been most exposed to the line. But professional women who wanna feel seductive and empowered but are restricted through a corporate dress code. Um, and also women who struggle with mainstream sizing and like the fact that they can find uh, seductive clothing and basics in their size. Um, I look at this as Lalita 2.0, which is essentially going from all of our exposure into real revenue. And the first phase of this is really focusing um, on selling best-selling ba basics with a targeted market marketing strategy to focus on direct-to-consumer and still staying in key tail lo retail locations with the one-to-one -one mission behind it um, and exceptionally well-made products and press. And doing this through targeted online marketing, website optimization, SEO, strategic partnerships, pop-up events um, and influencer campaigns. And then from there, looking to relaunch additional products, introduce new colors um, and use this to uh, keep our existing customers um, coming back. And then from there, looking at opening brick and mortar locations in key cities and a later acquisition by a conglomerate such as a carrying or LVMH. Some of our milestones, 2015, I mentioned the Kickstarter. Um, I had a design patent on packaging. Um, I was a winner of WeWork Mission Possible. I was interviewed on Business Rockstars for um, how to create an authentic brand. We had discussions with stars on TV partnerships. They've actually come to me twice for two different TV shows. Um, did Fashion Week last year, pivoted into face masks, just did a contract with Warner Brothers for vests. Um, and despite this, I've actually had increased sales this, this during COVID um, and launched in a few new stores as well. Um, essentially, I've had about 200,000 raised through fam family, friends, and Kickstarter, about 18,000 in revenue through COVID, and just north of 30,000 in revenue last year, um, which I actually consider a live development because I was working on the ready-to-wear and handbags, uh, but um, then COVID happened, um, and we enjoy pretty high margins. And 12-month goal is really just, is not just, but expanding the reach, getting more monthly visitors, having an increasing monthly sales in the next year to 100K and then looking forward to getting 750,000 or more in the next three years um, in monthly sales, primarily on direct to consumer. Um, so the current raise is $300,000. And I see this as a trifecta of looking at team build out inventory and customer acquisition slash marketing because all three are necessary in order to move this um, company forward and to reach a sales goal um, in the next year. So thank you for listening. And thank you, Rena. This looks amazing. Thank Investors, you. you now have five minutes to ask questions. What's your cost of acquisition for a new customer? So at this point, I haven't really had any meaningful marketing to give you an accurate number on that. It's all been through word of mouth or through newsletters, um, but I haven't had a marketing budget to work with to give you an accurate number on what the customer acquisition cost would be. 
I think what are you what are you anticipating or or what it what should, have you modeled what that might look like how much it might cost I have discussed with um, one of the mentors actually I was working with in Eureka who specializes in marketing and we looked at like a 40 to $60 um, customer acquisition cost. And right now our average ticket price is about 175. Um, it's gone up again as mass sales are dropping and other stuff is picking up. Um, and we do have repeat customers. So we are also looking at a higher um, lifetime value of customers. Um, I Go ahead, Carolyn. Thank you. I just love to hear more about how you're going to direct the marketing dollars because there seems like there are two different customers. There's your kind of traditional female customer you gave us an age group, et cetera, but then there's also the larger size customer and those might be found in two different locations. Um, and just from a marketing standpoint, can you just talk about literally how are you going to plan for and attract both of those key target customers? Um, that's a really good question. Um, and, and it's why I use size inclusive as a opposed to plus size because I realize there is a difference in terms of marketing. And I think now with the push towards using real women in campaigns and sort of sticking in the average size market as opposed to skewing one way or the other, but to show a range um, because I really do, I genuinely do have women from two through 18 who've been purchased products and enjoy it. So I wanna show the, the realness and the wearability um, across those categories. Um, it might involve, essentially picking a lane first and then expanding out of it. Um, and really that's what I wanna do overall is picking a lane, going with it and seeing where it can go and then branching out from there, but getting that focus in. And do you expect your sort of environmental push, you know, the environment, environmental friendliness, et cetera, to be part of that marketing campaign or just kind of a statement of who you are and you, you're letting it speak for itself? Um, thus far, I've let it speak for itself. I mean, the fabric has been, you know, it's custom made. It's been a selling point as people feel it. And then now bamboo is actually getting more awareness. So there's less um, consumer education that has to happen around it. Mm -hmm. I think it is relevant in the sense that fashion has really hit accountability this year in terms of being the second worst polluter. So people are interested in knowing that you do want to account for how you can be part of the solution and not the problem in um, creating more pollution so but I don't in essence I think what you're asking is am I going forward as a sustainable brand exactly and no I wouldn't say that I would say that sus the sustainability is part of our ethos but not the driving factor I it was just trying to get a mental picture of the marketing push you know who's a customer what are you focusing on is it your manufacturing etc and and just what's your market position basically yeah okay. understand I love the uh I love your brand mission I think I'm um, right now a little bit too basic basic so I'll have to, um, <laughs> to look into this uh, uh, but question on you know, sort of the customer experience uh, you know mm -hmm. you called companies like Bomba sometimes that defensibility sort of building out great customer service great customer experience I think with the brand that you're building here you could do some really innovative things mm -hmm. talk me through a little bit how you're thinking about that um, as you as you go to your main launch well, part of what's always been a part of the brand, um, and I don't want to lose that, is sort of the personal touch of including letters with that, of having beautiful packaging, of really making it worth a price point that people are feeling the complete experience of it. Um, so I don't want to lose that as a mass market brand, but still keeping that personal touch. And um, it's actually more of a norm for me to people to thank me for the product and how well they feel than it is for me to just send it off and never hear from them again. Um, so I think that that's a valuable part of the brand. So it's figuring out how to translate that, having great customer service, being able to explain sizing and um, value in it to customers moving forward. On the customer service side with this next raise, how are you thinking about supporting, supporting that? Um, do you mean in terms of outsourcing or? Yeah, is that what you mean? Sure. yeah. yeah no, I, I look at, I mean, definitely having someone in fulfillment, but keeping that close to home and not, uh, I think fulfillment is a very big part of this. And by that, I just mean, again, the packaging, the experience, the notes, the personal touch um, and working with a company that understands that and is able to deliver a, you know, a high quality product. Yeah, just a quick suggestion as you think about your presentation, and it was really a lot of great things in it, seriously, is mm -hmm. 
because sustainability, et cetera, and the fabric choice, et cetera, is an important part of that message you're communicating, you sort of, you miss out here in the presentation on the who, what, when, and where. You know, it's like, who, who's doing it? How many SKUs? What were you <laughs> adding here? Where is it manufactured? You know, it's just the blocking and tackling. But from the standpoint of making people know that you can do this, that you can scale, and you're ready to scale, yeah. uh, you know, from a company that's still kind of a, a bit younger to scaling fast in a year's time, it, it probably behooves you to put that in there, just in a side recommendation. Because I don't know the answers to that, having heard the presentation. Like, where are you manufacturing? Where are you sourcing your fabric, et cetera? Okay, I, I, I can actually quickly address that if you like. Sure, go for it. Uh, all of our hardware and fabric is sourced overseas. It's been done in China. And all of the manufacturing, with the exception of packaging um, and our martini picks, <laughs> Um, are all made in Los Angeles because really it's the detail that is part of the product. So I think it's important to keep that close to home and to keep it local, but being just fiscally responsible doing the, the, the fabric and hardware overseas. Um, I have had stuff, I have several contractors I work with in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I have another, one of my um, advisors and sort of, uh, he, has had a public company. He did production. He was in fashion for 30 years. He's owned a factory. So some of, through his connections, I've actually had everything sourced in factories overseas as well. Um, and looking at scaling and what that looks like, uh, you know, in terms of mass producing it. So I have people behind me who've scaled before and, and have contacts as well in the industry to, for that next stage beyond just sort of local, you know, a few thousand units. Here. Great. And then because it's, it sounds like DTC is the real focal point of the business growth, at least near term, you may want to also just hit on, you know, okay, X number of people are coming to the top of the funnel, how many people are converting, how many people are, you know, going through your products, how many people are purchasing, how many repeat purchasers, and just give a better sense of the KPIs. Because again, the growth in that first year goes from what, less than 100,000 to a million in 12 months, I believe is what the number said. Um, and that doing that where it's mostly DTC is a real, you know, that's a blocking and tackling kind of effort, you know, is marketing to the right people effectively using your money. So really showing, showing potential investors how you actually, how you're successfully moving people through that funnel to purchase. And you mentioned before you've had two returns, which is something short of extraordinary in apparel. Um, actually, maybe not even credible, I don't know. <laughs> the first time I've ever heard it before. Um, but how that's happening. I mean, is what's happening in the experience that's leaving people with the right size, with exactly what they want. Something's happening that we're not sort of holding on to that is just so unusual in the apparel sector. So a little more about that, if you would. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. And then, so Rena, we'll have more time for you to answer more questions. Okay. Uh, we're gonna move to, to Phoebe now. Uh, but thank you so much for your, your, your questions and great job, Rena, on, on answering them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rena. Thanks. All right. Phoebe, over to you. Thank you, Travis. So hello, I'm Phoebe Rossi, founder and CEO of New Flowers. We are a scalable baked goods brand selling into grocery stores and retailers. Sorry, Travis, um, the arrows have disappeared. There they are. There you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so have you ever had that moment where you step into the grocery store and you are confronted with an uninspiring range of baked goods? You're disappointed. Can you imagine not being able to eat birthday cake on your birthday? Almost one third of the adult US population cannot eat wheat-based cake on their birthday. Fresh gluten-free is not widely or consistently available for consumers here in the U.S. Options within the category are nutritionally poor and frankly taste terrible. There is a nationwide per pervasive problem here, nearly 100 million people that can't get good food. Well, we have the solution. What we've cracked um, is a proprietary flour blend that has a high quality, is nutritional, and is delicious. We provide a full range of dessert to pantry items with a quality that not only is phenomenal for gluten-free, but with many of our products surpasses standard wheat-based expectations. What we offer is cakes and breads that everyone wants to eat, not just the gluten-free person at the party without anyone having a less than satisfactory experience. In a fragmented market, our competitive advantage is our combined features. 
we have developed a proprietary set of formulas that emulate wheat-based products while maintaining nutritional value and incredible flavor. Specialty diet consumers are highly loyal when they find a brand they love. Our product diversification supports channel buyers and end consumers in shopping deep across New Flowers products. And with our logistics chain solution, our products are baked fresh and shipped frozen, maintaining freshness while avoiding unnecessary preservatives and additives. In a proven and growing market, the market potential is significant. As I mentioned, one in three adults in the US population avoid gluten in general to improve health. That is in addition to the one in 100 individuals that need to consume a gluten-free diet for medical reasons. The US gluten-free market is growing at four times the rate of the total bakery market with gluten-free baked goods, the fastest growing market segment at 55% of the gluten-free market share overall. This is an outsized market opportunity as gluten-free baked goods are currently less than 1% of the 20.9 trillion baked goods market here in the US. Gluten-free baked goods, as I mentioned, is still a fragmented space with a lot of room for growth, particularly in the specialties category. The largest players have no more than 13% of the total market share and have focused primarily on pantry staples and the snacks segment with cheaper quality using filler ingredients like corn syrup and cheap white rice. New Flower's focus on maintaining quality and taste combined with our experience in research and development enables us to rapidly expand within product categories to fit consumer demand. Clean label, natural, healthier for you foods are trending and we have the benefit of riding the, from the gluten-free trend to the longer sustaining, natural, ethically sourced and healthier for you trend. It's a really exciting opportunity. I'm sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Travis, those arrows keep on disappearing. There you go. There we go, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have a multi-channel strategy that has enabled us to capitalize on the COVID opportunity. Prior to COVID, we had a well-diversified strategy so that even when retail and food service took a hit, we leveraged wholesale to accelerate our strategy and come through COVID as a growing company. We sell to all three of these channels. Tactically, we're focused on the natural foods and grocery channel. We use the reality of COVID to focus and drive key channels to faster growth and launch into this coming year. Our focus on regional buyer relationships has laid the foundation for strategic growth. We currently have 25% of our sales for 2021 confirmed, and we are currently in multiple extended conversations with national chain buyers. We are currently accelerating market traction by increasing our sales team, bringing on additional distribution partners, and focusing on distribu distribution partner marketing initiatives. We are currently working with one co-manufacturer to support production needs and are in production testing phases with additional manufacturing partners to support rapid channel growth as we move into new markets. Although we did experience financial reduction this year, we were well positioned for COVID. We were able to accelerate in the channel that we already had competitive positioning in. We were able to pull back on sales and marketing spend in channels that weren't working like food service and refocus on grocery. As we redoubled our focus, our sales efforts translated into a significant increase in account value, increasing our annual account value from 1900 to nearly $4,000 per account. We currently have an average profit margin of 45%, which I anticipate will improve as we scale. I have built a business based on product quality and integrity and have brought together an all-female team with an, a collective experience of nearly 50 years in the consumer packaged goods, food and beverage category to grow and scale our brand. I'm founder and CEO, and I have primary experience in gluten-free baked goods product development. Leslie Dixon is our director of sales, and she has grown multiple natural food brands. She also has some dist uh, distributor experience, um, having worked with multiple distributors, including UNFI, which is the largest natural foods distributor here in the US. With decades of food and beverage marketing experience, Lori Spencer has been a strategic advisor for multiple rapid growth consumer product goods brands, including Red Plate Foods and Salt and Straw. Um, she was also co-founder and exited Oregon Chai. 
I'm currently raising a seed round of 550,000 on a convertible note. This round will firmly solidify New Flowers as a Pacific Northwest brand for gluten-free baked goods and initiate our launch into the California market. Uh, product initiatives include new product launches, building our SKU range for greater uh, SKU coverage per outlet, and building additional co-manufacturing relationships. Sales and marketing includes additional sales team for sales support, advertising and marketing initiatives, including industry trade spend like promotions, demos, and building brand awareness. Um, our key relationships with grocery category buyers supported by our sales and marketing and strategic manufacturing partners will support our continued growth as we launch into the broader market space. With a dedicated team, we anticipate significant growth this year, this coming year, and as gluten-free continues to be a rapidly growing category. Our opportunities are to scale and we are seeking funding for growth. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, now we're opening it up for questions from the investors. Awesome. Oh, hey, Phoebe. Uh, that, was, that was great. Um, a couple questions for you. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, some innovative logistics and, and how you're thinking about logistics for this. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and how that process is helping you bring a better product uh, to market today? Um, yes, so um, I'll, I'll back it up just a little bit and talk about our manufacturing process. So we're currently working with one co-manufacturer um, and onboarding a couple of additional co-manufacturers to support growth. Um, and logistics is essentially taking fresh baked product um, because our, our, um, our space is a natural um, food space, you know, premium product. And so with that comes preservative free, but our challenge is when we're preservative free, we have a very short shelf life. Um, so our, our simple solution for that is um, producing and then instantly freezing our products. So it essentially sets that shelf life at day one, and then it's all shipped frozen and uh, arrives at our retailers um, frozen, and then it's slacked out as fresh. And once it's slacked out into that bakery, um, bakery case, that's when the time starts ticking. Um, so it's essentially a cold chain product, um, but it's applied to baked goods, which is a little different. And do, do you know if that's uh, um, common with other gluten-free brands or they have more preservatives or uh, fillers in them that allow for a different process? Uh -huh. um, other gluten-free brands have a slightly different approach. So um, like I had on the competition slide, Udi's, um, yeah. which is like one of the old, you know, I, I call them a granddaddy in the space. <laughs> um, and they're very rice-based um, and they're very preservative-based. So they're one of those breads that is going to be baked um, and it just, it, it ships ambient temperature and it sits on the shelf for two months. And it's also very dry. Um, it's, it's not what I would call a, a desirable product. Um, and then you have other brands like Red Plate Foods, which will um, ship uh, re uh, refrigerated temperature and be slacked out into the cold case. And so that does lengthen their shelf life, but it doesn't extend it. And it also um, alters the texture and quality. Um, it's, it's like eating you know, re a refrigerated cupcake, but when it comes to room temperature, it never um, relaxes into that um, crumb texture that you really expect from that type of product. What is the shelf life when it thaws and is put on a proper uh, shelf? Um... Yeah, most of our products have a shelf life of seven to 10 days. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And could you talk a little bit about the range of SKUs? I was floored by how many different products you have. It also made me hungry <laughs> on the day, but that's the thing there. Um, and here's where I really wish I could pitch in person because I just want to hand everybody a brownie. <laughs> Right through the zoo. Um, I would love to hear sort of what, what's the average number of SKUs a, a retailer might buy. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, it just seems like from an inventory standpoint, how can you possibly supply that much um, as a you know, Ab small. Absolutely. Yeah. So right now we're treating the Pacific Northwest kind of as our test region. Um, and so uh, one of our distributors is carrying uh, 14 SKUs, which is high. Um, that's not something that we can launch even uh, West Coast with. Um, another of our distributors who has a broader range is um, running eight SKUs for us right now. 
Um, but essentially, we're looking at launching into California with um, five at most six SKUs. Um, and those would be coming uh, probably from two different co-manufacturers, not from a single shop. So. Got it. Yeah, and those, those SKUs, um, like I, I had mentioned before, um, customers are very loyal when they find a brand they like, especially in the specialty food space. Um, and especially when it comes to gluten-free because there's such a range of flavor profiles and textural profiles. Um, and so we have developed um, cakes, we've developed a couple of cookies, brownies, what we call bar cookies, and then breads. Um, uh, the average um, customer cart for specialty food is $102 compared to a regular buyer, which is $45. So people are used to paying more for a premium clean label product. Go ahead, Aurelia. A couple questions. Um, seven to 10 days is what you said the shelf life is. So what, what percentage of spoilage are you getting or what, what kind of loss on the product? Mm -hmm. And then my other question was with regard to, you said you had increased the number or the, the price of the order from 1900 to 4,000, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, tell us more about how you did that, what that looked like, and um, yeah, because I mean, obviously, I'm looking at your financial growth from 2020 to 2021, and then it shoots up in 2022, and so I'm just wanting yep. to get a little bit of background there. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, this year, um, COVID was a challenge. <laughs> um, we essentially started the year with almost 200 um, accounts, and um, between mid-March and mid-April, we lost a hundred of them. Mm -hmm. um, but what those hundred were, um, were primarily um, small independent um, uh, food service accounts. Um, and so it was, you know, people that had been ordering for years, but it would be, you know, like $20 a week, uh, like a case of brownies or, you know, a, like a case of bread and a, a case of brownies. And so it was very consistent, but they were much smaller accounts. Um, but instead of having to do all of that accounts management, we had already been leaning into this new model of supporting retailers and grocery. Um, and so um, we just said, okay, we don't have to manage these accounts now. Let's bring on additional sales team and let's really double down into this new sales opportunity. Um, so we took that, the handful of accounts that we still had, really focused in on that and actually ended up adding new retailers to that list as we leaned into our new model. And so we lost a lot of those smaller, smaller accounts, but we were able to focus on high value customers. And spoilage just really quickly before. Uh, right, actually um, spoilage today is very, very limited. Um, I think I have it budgeted right now at 2%, um, but I'd say for this year, it has been significantly less than that because we've been really, really watching our, um, uh, our distribution supply, so. Thank you, Phoebe. And we're on to the next one. Thanks, Thank Phoebe. Fanny. Oh. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Fanny Grande. I am the CEO and co-founder of Avenida Productions. Avenida Productions is a one-of-a-kind production company we are committed to transforming Hollywood by empowering independent filmmakers to tell stories that celebrate diversity. Okay. So what is the problem? Filmmakers from diverse communities are famously left out from receiving any types of funds when it comes to producing their projects. Um, it is no secret that Hollywood excludes people from diverse communities, and that is women, people of color, and the LGBTQ community. And those lucky films that do get produced, only 75% of them actually receive proper distribution. I mean, the market size is pretty big, uh, especially in the US. It's a $31.5 billion industry uh, yearly of that. 4.8 billion is created by revenue from independent filmmakers. And in the entire world, 95% of the content that is being created is being done by independent creators. So as you can see, it's a 
huge opportunity. So what's our solution? We started thinking, how do we transform Hollywood? How do we empower filmmakers? Well, first we provide filmmakers with the tools to raise funds successfully via crowdfunding. I will say that I am the best coach in the country right now when it comes to crowdfunding for media products. Then the filmmaker takes those funds that they have crowdfunded, which are free money in essence, and they produce their projects. Some of the films that have been produced have won major awards and received major recognition. And then we circumvent the Hollywood model by distributing directly to audiences. And how do we do that? We launched a cinema on demand platform called Indie Seats. We have made partnerships with about a thousand or 2000 screens around the country. And we're very proud to announce that we just got AMC, which is the largest theater chain in the country. So now filmmakers are gonna be able to fund, produce and distribute their films directly in movie theaters. We completely cut out the gatekeepers and the traditional players and we're empowering filmmakers to connect directly to audiences. So our achievements, uh, I wish I had 10 of these slides to share with you, but just some of our achievements, we've raised $3 million for 130 projects. Some of our clients have received major awards. Uh, we had a client that just got nominated for the Emmy. Another client received the Student Academy Award, uh, the BAFTA, and they've also received major distribution uh, on platforms like Netflix, HBO, Stars, and PBS, et cetera. Uh, we've also co-produced two very successful events during the Sundance Film Festival, which is the most important film festival in the world. And we produce three feature films actually and a web series. This is in just four years. So our founding team is my husband and I. Um, I am actually a filmmaker. I'm originally from Venezuela and I went to school for acting and directing and filmmaking. And uh, I've worked for the traditional Hollywood system but also done my own thing. And my husband is has been a top sales manager for a lot of st startups. So combined, we, you know, we're the perfect team. Our staff is very diverse. And I wanna also say that when we produce, most of our crew are female. Our, our show that we just produced, it was 99% female. So this is where it gets fun. Uh, we have a very unique revenue model. We have three pillars. We actually can make money at three different stages with the same client. So a client walks into our studio, this is our studio by the way, and they, play a, they pay us a fee uh, for crowdfunding. So not only do we get the fee, we also get 10% of everything that was raised. Then we take those funds and we produce the project and we get paid as the production company. And then when the movie or the project is made, we're gonna be launching it on Indie Seats and we get a fee plus 50% revenue of every ticket sale. So as you can see our revenue model, we've had a pretty steady uh, growth uh, of about 28% every single year. This year, uh, the entertainment industry was you know, heavily affected, but we've been able to pivot. And in just the last two months, we raised $200,000 via crowdfunding. And since we're launching Indie Seats, we're projecting uh, a very high growth uh, starting next year. We've been getting a lot of phone calls and production is back running back with with certain uh, COVID restrictions. So these are very modest projections and we're really excited about the future. Why Avenida? We've created a fully independent ecosystem, you know, that's separate from the Hollywood monopoly. We have 100%, nearly 100% success rate and we're filmmakers. I've actually used this model for my own film very successfully and we're just replicating it uh, for other filmmakers. Competition, we don't really have competition because we're a one of a kind company, but I wanted to share with you just what's out there. These companies that have listed do separate things. Some of the things that we do. So Seed and Spark is a crowdfunding platform. Uh, we would wanna, we wanna launch our own next year. This is what the investment money is gonna be used for. And we will automate the coaching. We'll, we'll make it, we'll streamline it, just not just for the filmmaker, but also for the patrons. Then you have Array, um, they're a grassroots distribution 
um, were different because they usually distribute two to three films per year and we have hundreds of filmmakers and their focus is mainly on the African-American community and we focus on all underrepresented communities. And Gather was a cinema on demand platform. They just become all digital. So we're coming in and we're gonna fill that gap. So we're very lucky that you know, most of our clients come to us by word of mouth and by referral base. We have done some social media marketing. Um, our plan to grow the company is to increase those efforts with the social media marketing. Um, of course, do some traditional advertising in regional markets when it comes to the indie seats. Also, we wanna partner some more with film festivals like Sundance, Tribeca, and host events. And we wanna invest and use marketing dollars, partnering with different filmmaker groups that we already have a relationship with. We're looking for a $250,000 investment at a valuation of 1.5 million. We're gonna use 30% to develop our own uh, crowdfunding platform, 25% for sales and marketing efforts, 15% to automate the coaching because a lot of it is done by people right now, but because of our experience, there's parts of it that can be automated and 20% to launch the cinema on demand platform. And we wanna also get some production equipment that we can later rent out to our clients. These are just the timeline. I don't really have time to go over it, so enjoy, but we've done a lot in just four years. So, you know, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I really hope that you join us in helping transform Hollywood to become a more inclusive industry. Thank you, Franny. Now we have five minutes for questions from the investors. I, this is a crazy one, but I'd actually love to ask you the back end of the process, which means if somebody invests right now, how would they get their money out back end? I, can, I haven't figured out yet. I understand your business model and the three pillars of how you make money, but what would be an exit strategy for somebody who invested in the company? In the company? Yeah. Well, we have a rapid growth. Um, we're I'm going to bring on my husband who takes care of most of the time. Oh, <laughs> put the cart before the horse, but I couldn't help. Hollywood. She's really the boss, but. Oh, wow. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so the, the way an investor would make money on this is obviously um, we would do you know, revenue sharing, but ultimately we're headed for acquisition. This wow. is a one of a kind. This is a one of a kind company that we have realized it is completely unattended. And when we look at comparables of studios, I mean, it just for instance, I give you Tyler Perry Studios, they're still in the growing phase and they're valued at a $320 million company. So there's a lot of room for growth. And generally in this industry, once you get to a certain point, these other buyers want to eat you up and acquire you. So we are headed into a position for uh, selling this company. And we already have studios knocking on our doors just to you know try to connect to with certain communities or to to get our opinion on certain marketing strategies so that interest is already there we're already you know having meetings with disney warner brothers uh on the down low and we also have a lot of celebrities coming to us because crowdfunding is very um attractive to them because it's free money <laughs> you know you don't have to pay that back and also it's a way to market your project before it's even made. So you create a fan base on a project before it's even produced. Right. And you're doing it one by one, so project by project. Um, I don't know how yes. to say that. Because they're financing well, them one. There's no, well, you understand what I mean? Not, not necessarily. At times we have 10 projects at a time. Mm -hmm. And what we do is um, We've run like 20 to 30 crowdfunding campaigns at a time. So there are different stages. We do have a staff and we also have um, different producers that we work with. Yeah. Now the cool thing about this is that we're creating it for scalability and a lot of the automation that Fanny mentioned, things like that. So we are doing a lot of the hands-on ourselves, and we're starting to shift it by implementing certain systems. But with the funding we're seeking, we are seeking to make this scalable and automated so it's not so much hands-on and we can continue to work with and focus on the things that are actually scale the company. Yeah, really like your, <clears throat> your focus of scalability, especially with the next round in particular automation, exactly. educational content, uh, as well as potentially building out a marketplace with, with cinema on demand. 
I have a question on, on the crowdfunding side. Like, can you tell me a little bit, what's the profile of that person that's typically joining that campaign? Um, you know, is it a fan of a certain genre? Is it industry experts? And then <laughs> yeah. for that- for those Everybody. Those yeah. Usually, yeah, our crowd, uh, so our clients that come in, a lot of them are filmmakers that okay. just haven't had, haven't been able to to get their projects funded. But it's not just filmmakers, it's writers, directors, actors, or for example, one of our most successful projects was somebody who's in the industry, but in the financial side, not really a producer. And he just wanted to tell a story about his father. So even if you're not a filmmaker, but you wanted to make a movie, you can come into our doors and we'll walk you through it. At the end of the day, we're coaches. So he crowdfunded and produced, won every festival that he was, uh, he screened his movie at, and now he's about to sell it like this week. So. And on the other side, those people participating in the, in the crowdfunding, like who, who is that profile typically? And you know, what's their sort of their uh, motivator to-, to So what we do, thank you for asking that. So because our creators are mostly from underrepresented communities. We are able, and that's the secret sauce really at Avenida, is we come up with a mission statement per project. This is why you should support this project. For example, we had one that was about uh, healthcare for trans men of African-American community. That is very specific. So if you are a member of that community of you or an ally, that's who you support. Or for example, we also have people who are just fans of a specific genre. So we had a Western, but this Western was different because it was led by women, right? You never really see a Western being told from the women point of view. Of course, a lot of the Western uh, fans and you know actors and people who, who, who just love seeing women in, in position of power, they contributed to that place. Now our celebrity campaigns, you know, like John Leguizamo, we just did Alyssa Milano, right? They have their own ecosystems, but we're able to create a mission statement based on each and every project that's going to not only during the crowdfunding, but it's going to follow the project all the way to distribution. Do most people use all three of your services? We No. So most people will do, they'll come in stages. This is why we're looking for the investment because we want to create this ecosystem. We've had that happen with five of our projects or six of our projects. Uh, and Indie Seats, we are literally just soft launched it last week. So we haven't done that, but we've done, uh, a lot of people come for crowdfunding and they'll return for the production or they'll just hire us to produce. So that's what's great about it. Even with the Indie Seats, we don't have to necessarily coach them. They can just use the service. Uh, or they can use our platform to crowdfund. Um, that's what that's the beauty of it. Thank you, Penny. Well, so I just want to say I'm a huge fan of what you're doing. So I'm actually an investor. I was an investor in an early indie film, a Latino-based film. And so I get the huge barriers to doing this. So good for you. I've got a lot of questions, but I think I'm getting cut off. So I will just say, good job. Thank you. We'll Thank open you so up much. a little bit more time to, to make sure you have um, the ability to ask questions. But in a moment, we're going to open up the floor now um, to hear from the community. Now that you've heard from three fantastic businesses, we want to hear from you of, um, oops, there we go. We want to hear from you, which company would you recommend to an investor? And so you should see a poll that's out now. Um, and I'll give you all one minute to uh, put in your answers or if you get everyone to respond before then, that would be great. Um, and then while we're doing that, I will introduce the, the next section. So this is a section where investors have an additional opportunity to ask any one of the businesses one additional question. Um, and so I will go through each investor and, and give them the opportunity to ask the one final question. And then we're gonna go into making the decision of whether you wanna continue the conversation with the entrepreneurs that you've heard from today uh, for a potential investment opportunity or uh, you'll pass. And so we'll go from there. And so I'll keep the poll open for a little bit longer, um, but I'll start with uh, Aurelia. 
So do I get to ask all of the, the companies or I just get to pick one question for one company? One question for one company. <laughs> okay. Um, so I will ask Amanita really quickly. Um, so you're proposing to found a FINRA approved crowdfunding platform as opposed to using one of the crowdfunding platforms that's out there right now. Is that correct? And how much yeah. are you anticipating that just that part of um, of the development will cost? Because I mean, I saw the percentages, but I actually know somebody who's done that. And I thought that the, the yeah. amounts that you were putting together might be a little low. Yeah, we actually, oh, can you hear? We yeah. actually are working with developers already that developed our Indie Seat uh, platform. So we know that this is very doable because they already sent us a proposal and this is why we're looking for this. And um, we're going to streamline it. This is gonna be a platform specifically for filmmakers and those in the art community. So it's not gonna be a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo. Um, so we're pretty confident that we can do it for the amount that we're asking. Including all of the regulatory? I'm thinking more yes. about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's correct. Thank you. Kelly. Thank you. Um, so I'll ask a question to New Flowers. Um, as, you're, as you're getting ready to expand into new markets, you know, what, what kind of is keeping you up at night? What, what are some of the top risks that are most top of mind as you go into this next phase of development? Sorry, I was still muted. <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. Um, the supply chain and logistics challenges. Um, uh, as you all know, there have been massive supply chain disruptions this year due to COVID um, and manufacturing and a fair amount has come back online, but there's still a lot of unknowns moving into the next year. Um, and so we're just trying to problem solve as quickly as we can. You know, we have our primary vendors, we have our secondary vendors, we have our tertiary vendors. So backups for our backups, um, alternative packaging that we can, you know, step in um, with if we need to. Um, but yeah, it's it's the supply chain challenges. Thank you, Phoebe. And Carolyn. Sure, I will continue with uh, with you on New Floor and ask you to actually um, just give us a picture of, as you think about your growth, the most um, essential elements of growth, whether that's, and if you would kind of in order of what's, uh, of what you need to see, is it new doors? Um, is it velocity? Is it, what are you really focused on to achieve that growth in the next year to two years? Mm -hmm. um, it's a combination of factors, but I'd say, you know, in orders of priority, mm -hmm. uh, doors, um, velocity, um, right now, um, well, I'm sure you've, I hope you've taken the opportunity to look at the financial model I, I sent you. Um, we tried to estimate it conservatively because um, in the marketplace, we've actually been doing better than that. But I know that once we get outside of our Pacific Northwest bubble, um, it's going to change and I don't know how, so I estimated conservatively. Um, and then beyond that, um, uh, understanding those alternative um, customer needs. You know, the Pacific Northwest has different um, food preferences than California, has different than Colorado, has different than the Southwest and the Northwest. And so it's really understanding those um, separate regions as ind independent markets and what their needs are. So did, did that answer your question? No, I, I think so. I'll, I'll give a thought. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Phoebe. And so now we're going into the round uh, to hear from the investors of uh, which companies you would like to continue the conversation with um, or do a pass on. So I will start with Lolita. So Golden Seeds. Sure, I'm gonna preface things by being very upfront with everybody. Golden Seeds is, um, is a fund, it's not a fund, it's individual investors that make up our community. Um, and I say that because there are size criteria imposed by the members themselves. What are they comfortable investing in? 
and companies simply have to be in the industries we're talking about, generally speaking, a bit larger than your than each of the companies you're at right now. But but you're close. You know, it's one of those. It's not this minute. It's probably you know next year, 2021. Um, in the I'll use the example in the consumer sector, uh, we look for that million dollar annual run rate and revenue. So. You know, uh, I <laughs> I don't need to tell you each where you are, um, but you can see that it's it's close, but it's not right now. From the standpoint of you know where I think we are and what I think the receptivity would be to Lalita, I, right now, based on where the company is, even regardless of size, I would probably pass on it for the moment. Size is a big big element of it, but the other is from a market position standpoint and apparel, finding that niche in the market that really says it's going to stand out to me hasn't been proven yet. It may well be proven, but it's not quite there yet. So I think Golden Seas members would be, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't jump on board quickly enough for you. Thank you. TBD Angels. Muted again. Uh, similarly, uh, TBD Angels is a group of individual, individual angel investors. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit on behalf of you know, my, my, my interest areas and what I think could, uh, could, could resonate with, with the group or, or other groups. Um, so in terms of size, similar challenge, you know, especially in the, the clothing and apparel space, we want to see a little bit more uh, progress and momentum against those customers that you're focused on. I think, you know, I really love the brand mission and there's a great idea there, but when it's in that early stage and it's more D to C product kind of looking for a little bit more momentum on the sales side, so we could understand, is this something we could help with? Um, is this something that we could, you know, our investment could help really help you cat catapult that to the next phase. So I'd say, a, you know, a light pass for now, um, but uh, certainly, open to having conversations uh, in terms of input or next steps or how I can help in other ways. Thank you. Echo that one, that's a good point. I'm, I'm being of help and, you know, until you reach that next stage. And then Citrine. Yeah, so I'll, I'll echo what, uh, what the other two said, which is, but I'll say it again in a couple of different ways. Number one, we're an angel group, not a fund. So everybody gets to make their own individual decisions. Um, on this, but we do look for a little bit more traction, not as much as Golden Seeds, um, but a little bit more traction than you have right now. That said, two things. I'm absolutely happy to speak with you individually, so feel free to reach out to me. Number two, Citrine allows you to apply online at any point. Like we, There's no gatekeeper, so you can definitely apply online and keep in touch with us mm -hmm. um, because I do want I think, I think you do have something that our members would want to see. So not quite yet, but, but there is, you can definitely kind of get in queue and start a conversation with people who are, um, you know, looking at pre-pitches and, and vetting folks. So please do keep in touch. We're not probably quite ready to have you pitch to the full membership yet, but um, like Carolyn said, not too far away. Thank, Thank you. you. Now to new flowers. So we start again with uh, Citrine Angels. Um, so Phoebe, I will tell you that for whatever reason, your financials didn't come through for me. So I did look at everything, um, but for, for whatever reason, the financials didn't quite come through. Um, that said, I think I got enough from what you have, and, and, and this might be operator error, it might be my computer, who knows, but the Google Sheet when I opened it, for me at least, didn't give enough, uh, it didn't give full data. That said, I think I would like to invite you to to apply for Citrine Angels. I think you probably are at a place that you could pitch to the um, group and we do have, we are about to open our next funding cycle and so then it would go to the, the pitch committee and I'm happy to put in a good word for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Kelly from TBD Angels. Yeah, so um, in terms of, and sorry, we've got some, some sirens in the background. Uh, everything's okay, it's New York. Um, but really love what you're building. Uh, I'm actually, personally, I have celiac, so I can uh, uh, well understand the challenges of chalky, not great products in the, in the gluten-free space. In terms of my background and what I would usually bring into uh, an angel group, 
Uh, I have less experience in sort of the CPG space, a little bit more on the tech side. So I'd actually love to follow up after this with uh, just a few questions that I have on, on some of the uh, your current business model. I have the same issue with, with some of the numbers. Um, for some reason, it wasn't, wasn't coming through. Just to kind of better understand your growth uh, trajectory and what you're looking to do in the next year, or if it makes more sense to wait a little bit longer uh, as you enter, enter the next few markets. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to do follow up. And then Carolyn? Yeah, I echo the sentiment on right kind of company, interesting white space in the marketplace. We do do CPG. I'm in the middle of a transaction right now um, for another food company. Um, again, a sort of a white, state, white space in the market where you feel like the competition just isn't doing what needs to be done. As you've heard, a little bit on the small side now. I, as we get into the next year, you're going to fit right into the pocket. I am have my guesses. And the other thing I didn't say before, and I should have, is Golden Seeds every month, once a month, holds office hours. Don't You just need to sign up. It's not an application where you have to get approved. Um, and in that way, every entrepreneur can use this time when it might be, quote, small for Golden Seeds, as it were, to actually engage with, whether it's myself or, in this case, in office hours, a couple of other um, of our members that can actually give you, you know, additional input, additional guidance. And there's also a presentation made during office hours that will help you understand what angel investors like those of Golden Seeds are actively looking for. So it may be helpful to any one of you, um, as I said, in the coming months, and we hold them once a month. Thank you. And now to Avenida. Uh, so in the interest of time, I uh, just want to uh, see from the investors who's interested in continuing the conversation and just let me, let me know. I would be interested in having a follow up on that, especially uh, from, from a tech standpoint, just wanting to a little bit understand uh, some of the platform background technology, what you guys are thinking about, uh, and that can potentially be of help. Thank you. In general, Golden Seeds doesn't fund things like movies. This is so different that I actually have to check into whether or not it's something that our members would fight into, as it were, um, because it kind of hits around the edges of, well, we don't do movies and TV shows, but what do we, what do you call this? So I will check further and get back to you. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Yeah, ditto. I'm not 100% sure that um, we would, that, that the members would take this combination of kind of services platform but I'm very interested in talking to you individually and I may have people I can put you in touch with. So um, let's definitely chat, please. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for participating both on the entrepreneurs getting ready for this pitch competition, especially over Thanksgiving and for the investors for joining us today. I will also share the results of the uh, the poll. Um, so it's going out live. Um, so the winner from the audience is Avenida Productions LLC uh, was 76%. So well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I just like to do a quick shout out um, to the Eureka community. We had fantastic coaches who have helped our entrepreneurs get ready for our pitch today. We also have additional resources in the community. If you're a business and you're looking to get connected to investors and get pitch ready, uh, we do offer a program within our community uh, with one of our co-founders, Rob, who will take a look at your deck, provide you with feedback. Uh, Carolyn from Golden Seeds has also offered uh, office hours that are held on a monthly basis. Um, and so thank you so much. Um, and we're excited to connect with you again. And for the entrepreneurs who've been matched to investors, I will be following up with you shortly um, to connect you by email to these investors so you can continue the conversation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you to all the entrepreneurs. It's very interesting, very exciting. Thank great you job, so much. all of you. It was great to meet you all. Looking forward to follow-up conversations. Thank you. Thank you for, thank thank you. You for the opportunity. <laughs> Thanks, Eureka. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care.